what's the difference between the abolitionist project and the hedonistic imperative? Um, the abolitionist project is focused on phasing out the biology of suffering in humans and non-humans alike. Uh, the question is, after we have phased out involuntary suffering, where do we go from there? Should we be satisfied with relatively mediocre states or should we aim to plunge on? Because technically at least there's no reason why life shouldn't be animated by gradients of bliss that are orders of magnitude richer than anything physiologically feasible today. Already we're homing in on the molecular signature of, of, of pure bliss. Um, given today's limited understanding it'd be very di very difficult to secure extraordinarily high functioning empathetic pro-social well-being that's also exceptionally blissful but in future as we understand more about the mind-brain uh, yes it would be possible to be much more ambitious true paradise engineering uh, though it's almost cruel to say so today uh, it may prove technically at least relatively straightforward to phase out the biology of suffering. Much, much more ambitious, however, is full-blown paradise engineering. Though uh, I don't think we should postpone any form of serious enjoyment until we've phased out suffering, nonetheless, one needs to be very, very careful pursuing the more extreme forms of pleasure that they don't diminish our empathetic concern for other sentient beings. Uh, indeed, I think we ought to treat the existence of suffering in both uh, humans and non-human animals as a, a, an emergency and be devoting our, our efforts towards, towards phasing it out. Yes. Mm. yes uh, transhumanism is a very rich and diverse movement with focus particularly on technologies of mood enrichment and phasing out suffering. But I like to think of transhuman civilization as being what one might call a triple S civilization. Super intelligence, super longevity, and super happiness. Uh, and one of the ways we can avoid getting entrapped into a, in a substandard utopia, a world that is, yes, much better than today's misery racked planet, but still nonetheless not maximizing uh, the potential of, 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 of sentient life, is to amplify intelligence. Uh, transhumanists approach intelligence amplification in a number of different ways. Uh, some transhumanists speak of uh, an imminent technological singularity, of which there are perhaps two main schools. One school of technological singularitarianism is associated with Ray Kurzweil uh, and essentially extrapolating current trends predicts that humans will essentially merge with our machines sometime towards the middle of this century. There is another strand associated with I.J. Good and most recently MIRI, the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, that sees a much more likely scenario as a singleton artificial general intelligence in which the prospects of biological humans are much less clear. But the particular kind of intelligence amplification that most interests me and I think is most technically uh, uh, feasible is uh, choosing the genetic makeup of our offspring uh, in such a way as to amplify our own biological capacities in conjunction with artificial intelligence. And the smarter uh, our AI, uh, non-biological AI, the more, uh, 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 the, the more sophisticated our interventions in our own genetic source code. And it's not just the next generation that will be able to tweak and amplify uh, their source code. In principle, at any rate, it will be possible to edit our own genes, 
allelic combinations uh, such that uh, you and I can become smarter. Um, one, needn't one needn't imagine that we will all need to be molecular geneticists because with time a, a, a gathering, a, 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 a range of sophisticated user-friendly uh, 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 tools become uh, available, suites that will enable us to do uh, uh, genome editing, epigenetic, epigenetic editing, so that one will no longer uh, be forced to make do with our existing genetic code. But this is probably two to three decades in the future, re realistically. Yes, intelligence amplification. Um, before even considering the prospect, I think it's probably worth considering what do we mean by intelligence. Uh, intelligence is a folk concept, it's not especially well defined. Uh, this is quite a controversial view in that many people in the IQ testing industry would try and convince us that IQ is a, a measure of general intelligence. Um, but IQ tests are mind-blind, they lack any kind of ecological validity. Uh, after all, what drove the evolution of distinctively human intelligence was our uh, superior mind-reading, cooperative problem-solving skills, and they're not tested for by IQ tests at all. So though autistic intelligence, as we might call it, is one facet of intelligence, uh, I would be very cautious with that about before identifying it with general intelligence. Uh, nonetheless, that said, in future it will be possible to enhance autistic intelligence uh, and many many other forms of cognitive ability to be possible to enrich our uh, empathetic mind reading intelligence capacity for social cognition higher order intentionality by intentionality I mean uh, I think that she wants that he hopes that we believe uh, Shakespeare was capable of sixth order intentionality most humans would stumble at anything more than five um, but uh, all sorts of cognitive capacity that are not tested for and in some cases are orthogonal to uh, what is tested in standard IQ tests. Um, another example of the kind of cognitive capacity that we should consider amplifying uh, is the exploration of psychedelia and radically altered states of consciousness. Um, it would be premature ethically premature, I would say, to explore most of psychedelia now because of the possibility of bad trips. What worries a number of people is the possibility that radical enrichment of our reward circuitry might somehow bring the whole enterprise of knowledge to an end. That if we really were blissfully happy and fulfilled, even if we did enjoy information sensitive gradients of bliss, that we would no longer be motivated to pursue different forms of knowledge. Um, on the contrary, I would argue that the enterprise of knowledge has scarcely begun. Now this might seem a rather bold claim to make, after all the standard model apparently exhaustively describes the behaviour of matter and energy at uh, most, uh, most sensible uh, 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 energies and temperatures. But what I have in mind is psychedelia, the enormous spectrum of radically altered states of consciousness uh, that are opened up by psychedelic drugs. Now, right now, it may well be irresponsible to urge investigation of psychedelia uh, because of the possibility of so-called bad trips, but there are countless state spaces of consciousness as different from waking, waking consciousness as is dreaming consciousness and these are currently inaccessible to us in our ordinary everyday states of consciousness. Their ultimate significance it's almost impossible to say after all how does one convey the significance of color and vision vision to a congenitally blind person or for that matter even more radically a congenitally blind culture but one advantage of phasing out the biology of unpleasant experience in our forward light cone is that we will safely be able to explore psychedelia What will be the successor today to today's ordinary waking consciousness? Um,
touched on how hedonic tone may be orders of mag magnitude richer, but there may very well be other radical alterations to our normal default state of consciousness. Uh, for example, motivation. As we understand the, uh, the basis of motivation, as well as hedonic tone, it will also be possible to arbitrarily amplify or, for that matter, uh, extinguish motivation and it may well be the case that our descendants will be hyper motivated every day of their lives. Our control over mesolimbic dopamine function for example will enable us if we want to be to enjoy hyper motivated states, uh, switch them on and off at will such that one can fulfill one's second order desires as to what kind of person one wants to be and what one wants to do. Uh, lack of motivation could be a thing of the past. Uh, the intensity of consciousness, it's, it doesn't come naturally off the t tongue asking someone how intensely are you feeling conscious today, but it may well be that the intensity of post-human consciousness will resemble human consciousness as ours does a glowworm, uh, and that post-humans may feel more intensely alive, well it will seem as though perhaps that humans have been sleepwalking for, for most of their lives. That's, that's, that, that's one possibility. Um, other, other states of consciousness, um, psychedelia, yes we haven't got names for the radically altered states of consciousness that psychedelic drugs and uh, in the longer run genetic engineering will open up, but the good thing is that once we have edited out the capacity for suffering, one can be sure that whatever we do discover will be generically sublime. Hmm. I, once one uh, has mastered our reward circuitry, it would be possible to, very crudely speaking, paint on bliss to whatever mode of sensibility, whatever state space of consciousness one wishes. Now one could, if one wanted to, simply make that state space of consciousness generically blissful, or one could aim for information sensitive gradients of, of, of bliss. It depends whether the particular state space of consciousness in question is recruited for any information signaling purpose and the vast majority of possible state, space of co state spaces of consciousness it seems have not been recruited for any information processing role. Um, perhaps one more example, uh, what about spirituality? Uh, now, I won't here at least enter into the question of what spiritual experiences actually mean, but once one actually elucidates the molecular signature of the divine and spiritual experience, we can in principle at any rate amplify and enrich it. And it may well be that the era of, 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 of spirituality has scarcely begun. Uh, as, as I said, as to what spiritual experiences mean, whether they have any transcendent significance or whether they're just glorified tickles, uh, I don't know. But one sh we shouldn't necessarily assume that post-human life will be secular in the ordinary, ordinary sense of the term today. Now, who is it who once said, uh, it's not hard to hear voices, it's knowing whether they tell you the truth. Um, if you were congenitally blind, lived in a congenitally blind tribe, and you were to take a drug that induced visual experiences, you would be quite right to think that these visual experiences were profound, yet their intellectual significance would completely escape you. If you were sensible, you might well stick to saying that they were ineffable and indescribable. And though many of the well-known gurus of, of psychedelia do stress that these radically altered states are indescribable, they do go on to then to attempt to describe them at, at some length. And I hope I'm not being unduly disrespectful to uh, some of these well-known figures to say that I don't feel that they really carry it off, that if I were completely drug naive and I were to read uh, some of the accounts given of, uh, of, of drug experiences, of, of, of psychedelic drugs, I would be profoundly unimpressed.